All these experimental designs can surely work up one's appetite. I could go for a snack. How about a muffin baked with a Latin square design? There are tons of muffin recipes out there. You probably want the one, though, that will give you the fluffiest, most delicious muffin and avoid one that produces a dense little nasty brick. Looking over the canonical Joy of Cooking text, we have three basic recipes to work from. One with regular cow's milk, one with yogurt, and the other with buttermilk, which, if you're not familiar, is just a cultured version of regular milk, kind of like half yogurt. The latter two liquids are slightly acidic, meaning that those recipes call for pure baking soda. However, when working with fresh, uncultured cow's milk, baking powder is used, which is baking soda plus a catalyst to get the reaction going. This reaction releases CO2 gas, which gets the muffin to rise in the oven, making it tall and fluffy. So which recipe will give us the fluffiest muffins? Let's design an experiment to find out. We have to first try to control for as many confounding variables as possible. First, we'll need to bake them in two batches. My oven and muffin tray are only so big, and factors can change between batches. Also, the position in the oven may have an effect on the muffins. Is it in the front, the back, near the wall, in the center? Some spots are going to be hotter, some spots are going to be colder. To account for this, we'll use a 3x3 Latin square design. You've seen a Latin square before if you've ever done a Sudoku puzzle. In general, the K by K Latin square has K symbols, 1, 2, 3, ABC, smiley face, frowny face, cat emoji, whatever symbols you want, which occur exactly once in every row and exactly once in every column. For us, an entry in a square will correspond to a cup on our muffin tray and one of the recipes to be tested. In this way, we can control for changes in the baking position. We'll also replicate this experiment twice using two different randomly permuted 3x3 Latin squares. This gives us more data and more opportunities to randomize out confounding factors. Now that our experiment is set up, we can run it. We're going to make each of the three muffin batters by hand, mix them up, then bake the first batch. We're going to measure and weigh measure the height and the weight of these muffins, then we'll bake a second batch. The weights were measured with a Cuisinart scale to the nearest gram. These could be considered as covariates, are heavier muffins taller or shorter than lighter muffins. Meanwhile, heights were measured to the nearest, nearest 1 50th of a millimeter using a dial caliper. I'm going to go and stake a claim now that I'm the first person absurdly stupid enough to measure a freshly baked muffin with a dial caliper. Prove me wrong, internet. Strictly speaking, this isn't a true replication though when we bake two batches. If we really wanted to replicate, we'd need to start over completely and make three new batches of batter. So instead of calling it a replication, we'll call it a first and second batch. Still a factor that we should test though in our experiment. So we can construct an ANOVA table to check for significant differences among our factor levels. And we find none! So much for that afternoon. Okay, we don't find anything strongly significant, but there are some things to note. One is that the row and the column factors, i.e. the location of the muffins in the tray, has a much smaller sum of squares that is a much smaller variation than the recipe or the batch factor. More interestingly is the box plot of height versus recipe. Our yogurt-based batter has a much smaller variance in heights than the other two. So, choose Greek yogurt for consistency, I guess. If we include weight as a covariate, we see that it is actually quite a significant predictor of height, with each additional gram contributing to an average increase of about a quarter of a millimeter in height. But not for all the recipes. As noted, the yogurt muffins are very consistent height-wise. Only the regular milk-based muffins show a strong increase in height correlated with an increase in weight. Lastly, we note that the second batch produced significantly heavier muffins. Why is this the case? Well, 
maybe I just filled them up more. I tried to level them out as best as possible, but it's a possibility. But I actually suspect that it could be also um, batter density. Batch one came from scoops at the top of the bowl, whereas batch two sat longer on the counter. Thus, batch one had more of the lighter ingredients scooped out, whereas batch two at the bottom had the denser ingredients. One subtle pedantic note before we conclude is that I used the same bowls of batter for all six muffins in each recipe. Therefore, they're technically not independent of each other. A true boss statistician would make a separate batter for each cup in the muffin tray, but I don't have the time for that. The conclusion we draw are now not for three different recipes in our recipe book, but for a given instantiation of each recipe. It's a subtle, pedantic point, but still good to discuss. Stay tuned to this channel for more experimental designs. Next time, you can watch me watch a pot of water coming to boil. It's actually more interesting than you'd expect, so I'll see you there.